you teach here how to how to use neurofeedback and hypnotic techniques? Uh, not neurofeedback, peripheral biofeedback. Okay. Because we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're very interested in autonomic regulation. Okay. Yes. And can you explain what you are doing there in treatment? If we think about autonomic regulation as being changeable with uh, the peripheral autonomic biofeedback, respiratory control, heart rate variability, skin conductance, skin blood flow as, as proxies, as as signals to feedback to learn about autonomic regulation and we teach young people with autism about doing that, that's very valuable because first it's not a social factor. A young person with autism comes into the office and I'm the tenth new doctor and they have to see a new doctor and they have to get to know a new person and they don't want to know a new person and I say, so can we start with video games? Can we start by playing with the computer? That's very good. So the primary relationship is a child to the computer, and we collaborate to play with the computer. And um, we can talk more about this later. Uh, we've developed some, some interactive media and some algorithms for tuning biofeedback to them. But the bottom line is, is they can use a variety of graphical user interfaces on the computer to learn how to drive increased vagal tone. And that it can be as pure as operant conditioning. It doesn't really require language skills. Um, it doesn't really require social skills as long as the feedback is valid and drives increased uh, vagal tone and decreased sympathetic tone in our pilot studies of doing this, we've seen reduction in repetitive behaviors, increased cooperation, increased prosody, uh, without specifically teaching any of those things. The hypnosis side is twofold. Number one, uh, they don't walk around with the computer. They don't walk around with that real-time feedback. So as part of that training, as soon as they're able to do that, I give them the choice. So would you like to turn the chair away or would you like to let your eyes close? In either case, then we start with projective imagery. So now take, keep the state going, keep this vagal tone going and place yourself into school, into wanting to talk to that girl in the hall you've been attracted to, uh, into physical education class, into doing homework this evening into the challenges of their life. So beginning to associate that changed autonomic state with challenging social or other situations. That's one piece of the hypnosis. But the other is that so many young people with autism find comfort in their competencies. So my favorite example is the little boy who came into the office with no regard for space and came right up to me and said, are we going to talk about narrow gauge railroads in the Southwest? Because that was his fascination, this system of narrow gauge rails in the Southwest United States. And he could tell me about all these train lines that started in the 1800s in the United States. So of course the answer is yes, that's what we're going to talk about. So another piece of the hypnotic part is getting to the point where he can run narrow gauge rail in the southwest in the back of his mind as a sense of competency and comfort without needing to express it and talk about it. Can that be a safe place that he carries with him? So those are the, those two approaches together powerfully reinforce a sense of self-control. Mm -hmm. To understand it in um so first, uh, people sitting in front of a screen. Well, heart rate variability. Uh, the heart yes, rate, yes. and then they are relaxing and seeing that the heart rate is going down, such things? Such things as that. What we developed, it's so great to work at Rochester Institute of Technology. It's a, it's a powerhouse of software engineering. So some students helped me figure out um, an algorithm that dynamically, over, you know, changing over time, 
would prioritize whichever signal was moving most rapidly towards increased vagal tone. So imagine that respiratory rate, heart rate variability, skin conductance, sweat gland activity, skin temperature, blood flow to the periphery, which is we warm up when we're comfortable, uh, are all fed into an algorithm and at the rate of about 50 times a second, whichever ones they're doing well are fed back in priority. We, it's like positive psychology in an algorithm or like a super therapist who can tell you what you're, it's a, it can only give you positive feedback on what you're doing well. So we call that the dynamic feedback signal set or DIFFUS. And it runs, it's behind the scenes and we, it can be seen as a stacked bar graph, but we also tested a number of different kinds of cartoon interfaces with young people with autism. The favorite one, there's a, as a male or female stress destroyer, which is a superhero with a cape, but then there's this stress monster. And the stress monster is spitting paintballs at the stress destroyer. And the paintballs come in four different colors, eat one for each sensor. But the stress destroyer has shields so as you lower your respiratory rate, as you increase your heart rate variability, as you increase your skin temperature, the corresponding shield builds up and the paintballs don't get through, and it's a zero-sum game. So as you defend yourself, the stress destroyer, the stress monster gets weaker and weaker. So it's really fun, and if you're having difficulty with the breathing, a little lung icon shows up and says, work on your breathing. So it, it collaborates to drive increased competency in increasing vagal tone. Uh, so, the, so the children or the adolescent are coming and say, I used to make computer games. Yeah. And the whole uh, idea of uh, going down with attention yes. is built in in this game with exactly. the shields and so on. So in a playful way, they are learning and yes. are motivated. <laughs> Uh, this wonderful little boy who's really took on the persona of the stress monster and his, his idiomotor signal when he needed to calm himself down was this, because he imagined posturing like the stress destroyer. Um, but, but like so many young people with autism, he was a very uh, primary process, fairly literal <clears throat> learner. and. Uh, so he, he asked me at the end of a visit, he said, his mother has tell, told me that he's been being the stress destroyer and using his skills, especially when his little sisters bothered him. And he said, but Dr. Sugarman, I don't have a cape. I don't, I don't dress like the stress destroyer. When does that happen? And I was very worried that the whole thing was going to fall apart. And I said, well, Sammy, that happens inside, in your mind. And he said, oh, that's a relief. That's much better. Then his mother, I'm just remembering this, then his mother said, Sammy, should I give you a signal or should I tell you when it'd be a good time to use it? Which is, of course, always a problem. Maternal or paternal interference always threatens autonomy. And he said, no. That would be embarrassing. And besides, Mom, it's a secret identity. It's really great. Yeah. So, so this, was, this is you know, engagement with that system, which is much easier than with having to figure out who this therapist is. <clears throat>